This is Trend Following Radio, where great thinking comes alive. Nobel Prize winners, legendary traders, best-selling authors, and the pros that know what drive us irrational human beings. I am your host, Michael Covell. Not filtered, raw, honest. That's my passion. So today on the show, I have an interesting guest. Uh, He is an administrative law judge in Colorado. And, oh, come on now. You're thinking, why, Covell, do you have an administrative law judge on from Colorado? I want to know about trading. Ah, hold tight for a second. My guest is Dave Cheval. And Dave uh, was once in an earlier life uh, on the floor and uh, sat at a desk with uh, with uh, with a woman who became his uh, became his wife, Liz Cheval, who became one of the turtles. And uh, I think uh, you know this is this is uh, uh, Dave's former wife and uh, uh, very collegial relationship and everything. But uh, I just think Dave will probably have some great insights into uh, the turtle story, trading, how things unfolded, and perhaps uh, some views on today. Dave, uh, thank you for joining me today. Sure, Mike. Thanks for having me. So let me get started. Uh, you know, because you've 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 you you're in an entirely different career today. Uh, you know, a judge in Colorado uh, is is quite a uh, quite a path from the pits in Chicago. So uh, you, you've got to go back and and date for me uh, your starting point in Chicago. My starting point was the summer of 1975 after my junior year of high school. Um, I had got a summer job as a runner down there. That's obviously back when the, everything was done by paper. Um, we'd run orders into various pits and I just fell in love with the action there. So following graduation from high school, I went down there back to the same firm as Conti Commodities, which was, uh, owned by Continental Grain. And, um, later became Refco. And I stayed there. I went to night school for undergrad and grad school while I worked uh, in the pits. Now, at if, if this time in the pits, did you did you look ahead uh, 20, 30 years and start to think about administrative law judge or this was, this was nowhere on the radar? Well, interestingly enough, I, my, my plan was to continue after an MBA to go to law school and again at night. And uh, that would have been in the early 80s. And at that time, things were going pretty well on the floor um, for me. And I just didn't uh, want to put the effort in for that four years of night school and law school. So when I eventually did go to law school, I, you know, the people asked why I waited to go until I was 41. And I said, well, I just took a small break after grad school and it happened to be 20 years. So <laughs> um, it was always a plan. Let me let me uh, try and uh, let you paint the picture some. So you are uh, you're 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 in the pits. You're you're in Chicago. You're seeing all this happen in the early 1980s. Paint for me the picture of your understanding uh, pre the turtles and how you looked at trading on the floor and perhaps how your understanding of trend following trading and the large type trend following traders at that time before the the turtle experiment uh, happened. Right. I guess my my personal perspective was very short term, of course, because it was all um, just trying to get the edge in, in the pits. I mean, um, and I did see a lot of things develop from the earliest days. I mean, one of my favorite stories is um, when I worked at Conti Commodities, um, Richard Sandor was there um, and he is kind of known as the father of financial futures. He helped develop the Ginnie Mae contract in the early 70s. And um, occasionally we'd have to work on his desk and from time to time someone would call with an order and we'd have to run and find him in the corn pit because he was in there just day trading corn to come over and do uh, financial futures because they were so, orders were so few and far between. But so my, my initial perspective was just trading, short term trading. And that's why I started to trade, um, would pretty much clear my positions out by the end of the day and just look for the edge. Um, most of the time I was on the floor, I was working as a, uh, a floor broker. Or, or working from the desk, uh, servicing you know large institutions. So, in that capacity, we would see some of the early CPAs, um, like Victor Niederhofer, um, Camel Company, of course, was around. Monroe Trout, John Henry, and some of the kind of fund to fund type people like Commodity Core, Kenmar. Um, so we'd see that kind of flow, and that um, made me start to focus a little bit more on longer term trading and, and trend following. In particular, which I really didn't get that interested in until the Rich Dennis experiment. 
Well, by being on the floor as a as a broker at, at the various desks, uh, you mentioned that all those names you just mentioned, but clearly C and D and Richard Dennis must have been on the radar screen at that point in time too. Absolutely. I mean, when um, got Scott Mistrada, I think was Rich's um, C and D's main broker, and he would go from pit to pit. So when he would come in, say for the soybean pit, for example. Trading wouldn't come to a halt, but it would certainly, they'd notice what he was doing. And once he made a move, um, it would, things would just explode. And volumes weren't where they're at today. So, you know, he'd come in and buy, you know, a million bushels of, of beans, for example, and you'd see just things would just go crazy. And it'd go crazy when you come in the pit. People just trying to anticipate um, which way he's going to go. You know, and sometimes they come in and fake it. He was off the, he personally was off the floor by this time, though. Scott Mastrata, Richard Dennis was, yes, right. yes, but yes. Scott was his, his kind of designated floor broker. So he'd walk into the bean pit or the corn pit or the wheat pit, or, you know, it was mostly grains a lot in the, uh, in the seventies. Um, and then as financial futures, of course, developed, he would, he would get into those other areas, but he had a big influence over, um, the day trading in particular. So how, how would you, how would you describe, uh, you mentioned a, a lot of these various names that are, that are that are famous to people that follow trading. Uh, many of the names, obviously, still today are, are big names like Paul, Paul Tudor Jones. Um, but what was the what was the feel in those first couple years before uh, the turtle experiment got going? Your feel or, or understanding of of Dennis was it more mysterious, or did you did you wrap your arms around it, or was he just the guy off the floor that just uh, was was the was the uh, the ex pit. Uh, trader who's now the king of commodities in Chicago. What, what was the feeling? Yeah, I guess that's it. I mean, he was a legend. I mean, um, I grew up on the South Side. Rich grew up on the South Side. So people knew about him. And there were a number of us that kind of came to the Board of Trade. And a number of my friends, that many of them are still there, that kind of followed me down there that all knew about Rich Dennis and all knew about the success that he achieved, you know, starting at the um, the Mid America Exchange, and then working his way over to the Board of Trade in, in such a short period of time, and making such uh, at that time an enormous amount of money. So we all knew about him, and certainly you knew about him in his presence when uh, he would come into the pit and do some trades because they were usually much bigger than the flows that you were seeing at the time. Did you have any feeling for his technique? No, no, I, I didn't. It was not until it, not until is you know I um, went to work with him um, right right in eighty three. Well, why don't you uh, why don't you paint that picture? Why don't you paint because because I think you you uh, from from our little little bits of conversation in advance you you uh, you you play an interesting role in how Liz became a turtle. Yeah, I I saw the ad in the journal Wall Street Journal, and um, you know at the time I think I thought I was doing really well. I don't know what I was making, $40,000 a year or something like that. Um, and bits and pieces here trading. And I believe the ad said, or they were going to pay 15000 I can't remember what it was. It was some small drop. Um, and I was working on the floor. Liz and I were ne next to each other on the floor. And um, I showed her the ad. And she went through the process and applied. Now, what, what was, I mean, you're both on the floor. You both know about his success. Um, you see this ad, uh, why didn't you apply? You know, that's a good question. I, I, I like to, I like to ask the hard ones here. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have a good answer for that. I, I, knowing all those people that were selected the first year, I wouldn't have had a chance to be selected. So, um, you know, I knew Liz, Liz is brilliant, um, math major. It just seemed like based on what I can recall of the ad, that it was just perfect fit for her and it turned out that it was mm -hmm. now you got you guys were just friends at the time i assume or or, or were you I i'm thinking no and that by 83 we're probably more than friends okay and you know i was definitely into that whole um kind of floor lifestyle which probably wouldn't fit as well with uh with what rich was looking for so you you were you were uh uh we'll, we'll just leave it at that I don't know what that means. We'll just leave it at that. <laughs> I've heard some crazy stories about the pits in the early '80s in Chicago, so we'll just leave it at that. Right. I'm sure there's all kinds of fun stuff to talk about. Um, so uh, you guys are dating, uh, and uh, she makes this application. Like, what was the conversation? What was the feel? Like, I mean, was it was it kind of like you know submitting the application and kind of. You know, maybe it'll work out. Or I mean, what, what was the what was the emotion behind the whole, the whole process? Or were you were you really even paying much attention to it at the point? 
Yeah, I mean, I th- and I think Liz has been quoted in talking about this that it really didn't seem real until she was in the interview mm-hmm. when 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 she thought I could get this. I, you know, she went through the process, you know, completed the application. I think there was a test or exams they had to take, and um, I I can't say that through the process that she didn't think she was going to get it, but I I think that what I've seen quoted and what I recall is that in the middle of the interview with Rich. She thought this is really good, and I, you know, I got a, ch- I've got a shot at this, and that's when it became real. Mm-hmm. And then she was selected. Well, it must, have, you know, I, I, in some ways, I, I don't even know where because we could probably talk about there's, there's, there's micro and macro lessons of all the things that you witnessed because obviously, within a few years, you both were married, and uh, so you, you basically were, were at a, at a unique vantage, a unique uh, catbird seat, so to speak of watching this this process unfold mm-hmm. i mean is that a fair that's a fair assessment you probably have yeah a, that's fair and in hearing you know you probably heard all the stories there were like groups that would clicks that would form and people were jealous of other traders thinking they were getting you know favoritism i think you covered this in your book um and that was all true and then it, you know different groups would come to our house and talk and have meetings and discuss uh, all that kind of infighting stuff. But overall, um, I think that they all did pretty well. I, I don't know if that kind of competition was uh, was set up to see how they would react to it. It's quite possible that it was just another grand experiment. But um, there were certainly a lot of personalities in that in those two groups. And um, yeah, I, I definitely saw all the stuff that went on during those uh, five years from 83 to 88 when it ended. Yeah, because I would, I would think your vantage is is kind of an insider, but really an outsider. And then, you know, and, and obviously you've been through uh, enough different experiences in your life and, and enough uh, uh, education to kind of look at it and say, and draw some unique conclusions, uh, probably maybe even different than people that lived it um, exactly. But let me ask you this, what from if, if we were just to talk... Uh, because later on, you went on to form, it was a CPO, right? It was called Dearborn? Yes. Mm-hmm. So you went on to eventually uh, allocate, uh, to, you know, put a fund of funds together and allocate two traders. Uh, I know that fund of funds worked with with Liz. It worked with uh, Paul Raybar. Wh- why don't you discuss for a second, and I'm going to kind of jump around a little bit, but why don't you discuss from your perspective um, I don't, I don't, you know, I, I think everyone knows that everyone that's taken a little bit of time to do a little bit of reading realizes that th- there were, there were some ex- extremely and, and clearly to this day, extremely successful traders that have really just, you know, become legends, frankly. And, uh, but there were probably some folks that really did not turn out to be legends. And I don't, I don't really think it makes much sense in this day and age to kind of really, you know, beat the negative drum about it, but I, we can talk in broad pictures about maybe some of the, the negatives that you saw in terms of lessons that people today could learn, but I was going to let you go, go ahead and first maybe, because I don't think you'd mind this in, in terms of naming, but the folks that you saw up close and personal, the turtles, and that that r- you really admired and probably maybe in, admired to, to this day. I know, I'll, I'll start with Paul Raybar. Right, yeah, Paul definitely uh, up on the top of the list. You know, in, in 88, um, what kind of led to, I think, the end of the program is Stig Asgard was one of the uh, turtles, and, and he started trading for um, Show Inc. or something. It's a, they started a fund, and I think once that happened, it kind of opened the floodgates to other people wanting to get involved. And it was a time um, in the markets when one of my partners on the trading floor and I um, were kind of looking for something to move into because we all kind of foresaw the electronic trading coming in and the demise of the, of the pits, even though that was a little bit early in the game. So we formed uh, Dearborn Capital Management, which today has about $800 million under management. Um, and we wanted to start one of the first um, turtle funds, if you wanted to call it that. So we considered um, many of the turtles. So some of that we considered that I don't think wanted to take pu- public funds that maybe are lesser known. Anthony Brock is a name that comes to mind. Um, he was I just thought a brilliant guy and a, and a great trader. Um, of course, Jerry Parker, um, Liz, Paul, um, Jim D. Maria. We allocated some money to a small part of our fund to him as well. So those are some of the people that stood out to us. What stood out about Paul? What 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 could someone today in 2012 
recollect because obviously Paul has had an extensive what what twenty five plus year continuous track mm-hmm. record. I mean that's phenomenal. People people say oh it is stuff only works for a day or a week or a month, and I'm like well hold on Paul Raybar has got a twenty five plus year continuous track record. So does Lee Chavall. So does Jerry Parker. So does Tom Shanks. That means right. nothing. So what about Paul? Can somebody in two thousand and twelve learn? You've spent a lot of time with him. What not necessarily trying to, to I know he's a very private man, but not trying to give away any private details. But the big picture ways that he viewed trading the world, the markets that made him successful? Well, I put Paul and Liz in the same category. Um, their discipline. And, you know, one thing when I listened to your podcast with Brad Rathy, when he talked about um, taking the emotion out of it. And I think those two were able to do that, um, in my opinion, you know, better than, than most traders. That it, it, for, for both of them, it wasn't about making money and getting rich, which they both did. It was about it was the game, you know, it's about winning the game. And, and it, it, Liz never talked about, and Paul never talked about, at least to me, about the dollars and the money. It was about the units or the this or the that. It was never about um, winning. Would you, would um, you, would you argue, though, that, that too, that maybe it, it was not as much about winning the game or playing the game the correct way, maybe focusing on the process and not necessarily knowing how rich or not rich they might become as long as they played the game the right way? Yeah, that's fair enough. You know, um, following the rules, um, managing it properly, um, and, and setting yourself up for the best outcomes. I think that's that they were two of the most disciplined people that I've ever known. And, uh, you know, that can't be said for everyone. I'm going to keep putting you on the spot about that because I, I just would love to get something that, that, that per, someone that's brand new and they, they, you know, they hear this, they read the, the trading books and stuff, and I'm sure I've got something out there that talks about it, but discipline. It, I'm trying to think if there's a way that uh, uh, is I'm prompting you that you, you you might be able to kind of reflect on discipline in a way where the average person might hear it and go, oh, that really resonates with me, as opposed to discipline in, in the larger abstract sense of things. Well, there's, I mean, I think about uh, in 1987 when the market crashed. I mean, that whole year um, leading up to October, um, everyone was long bonds, sorry, long stocks and short bonds. It was just, a, you know, huge trends, made tons of money. And just to see Liz's reaction during that, those two couple of days, it, it was amazing to me to see, you know, um, taking massive lo- or paper losses anyway, but just to still follow through with the program and follow the system versus having an emotional reaction, which is, you know, something that most people would do. That was uh, amazing to me. And, and that was true throughout the entire um time that I that I was close with Liz. I still have money with her and I've had money with her since she started trading in 88. So the other thing that I like about Paul and Liz is that they stayed um, loyal to the general system. In other words, looking for these big outsized gains in a small number of trades with these trying to capture those large trends. And some other folks, um, including some of the turtles that go on to have some great success, I think were more focused on making money, maintaining their business, having the most money under management versus um, exactly why Dave Cavanaugh and I picked Liz and Paul for the Turtle Fund is we wanted a fund that would have the possibility to capture those big gains. And um, that that's what I still look for. And that's why I still have money with Liz. I don't want to make 2% a month. I want to have a, a year where we make 180%. Well, she had that nice paper uh, years ago. One of the few things that I'd seen her really put out in public in terms of writing about high volatility trading and getting people to understand uh, the difference between volatility and risk. Mm-hmm. Well, that was something that we always stress. When I worked, I worked at EMC as well when I had Dearborn, and I can't tell you how many times um, we would turn money away. I mean, I remember early in the EMC years, someone wanted to allocate ten million dollars, but they kept harping on the risk, the risk, the risk. And I just said, "Listen, if you don't want risk, put your money in T bills. We're not going to take your money anyway." Because if you look at her track record, or any of the turtles track records, you're going to see um, these big swings. And that's exactly the, the type of uh, thing that Liz sold when she was raising money initially for EMC. We call it anti-marketing. We want to convince people that exactly what you're taught, what you just mentioned, the high, the high uh, frequency trading versus this risk. Don't focus on the risk. Look at the long and the big picture and um, allocate part of your money to these trend followers and you'll do well. Yeah, it's funny. If we look ahead to today, though, if we're talking about during that time period and then today, 
I think <clears throat> I think high volatility in terms of what the pensions and all these guys like, they still have not got to the point where they're willing to accept it. And it seems like to me that quite a few trend following advertised funds in this day and age are perhaps doing more things behind the scenes just to make things look smooth versus delivering a true trend following product. Exactly. Exactly. You know, um, and, and some of the big named turtles have done this, have done the same thing over the years. They've, they've really worried too much about volatility and tried to focus on having a billion dollars under management or $500 million under management versus um, kind of staying true to the, to the real, in my mind, the long-term trend following type of an approach. Well, because, you know, sometimes I think, you know, in, in, I think for the outside person, they might say, well, you know, if you can have a, if you can, if you can be in a fortunate enough position to run a $500 million fund versus a, a $10 billion fund, everyone chooses the 10 billion. And that's not true because there's a lot of interesting trade-offs in life. And, you know, you got to play the game, as you said early on, for more than just money. And just managing the most money in the world doesn't necessarily leave you with the best feeling when you wake up each day. Is, That's it, right. You know, and, 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 you know, it also limits kind of the places you can find the gains. You know, if you have two or $3 billion, you're not going to make as much money in the moves in corn and, and soybeans and wheat or commodities that we're seeing now because the markets aren't big enough. So I think some people have intentionally focused on trying to keep the money that they have under management um, manageable. So if you have a year where you have big gains in, in these smaller markets, you're still able to capture those and, and have an impact on the overall returns to the fund. Now, Tom, Tom Shanks seems like he's not really shied away from volatility over the years. No, he, no, he has not. I mean, that's he a good not. thing. I mean, you mentioned Tom. Tom's another guy, and he's a great guy, and um, uh, I, he certainly hasn't shied away from uh, worried about the volatility. Yeah, and and, and I, I it's it's easier to look at his track record and say, oh, I'd be willing to sit through it. But I don't think anybody, when you look at the results of his track record, would say, oh, I wouldn't want that. It's the it's the issue of looking at it afterwards and saying, oh, I'll take it versus oh, I could sit through it. Well, it's hard to sit through it. I mean, I do that now with um, over the you know the last decade with um, money they've had with Liz. It's it's no fun to see uh, 30, 35, 40 percent drawdowns. But again, and I, my approach is that if you have faith in the people who are managing the money and they're continuing to follow um, their system, that I have the expectation that we're going to have those outsized months or years that are going to um, to continue to be consistent. And that's that's been what's happened over the last 20 years. Why have the why is the basic philosophy, the basic trend following philosophy, uh, whether it's what Bill Dunn started in 1974, uh, what Liz was exposed to, Jerry Parker's exposed to, uh, you, you know, obviously David Harding's uh, done extremely well with it. Uh, what's, why, why is this basic philosophy? I mean, it, the basic philosophy has not changed. People could argue about their rules, their parameters, their indicators, whatever, but the basic philosophy has not changed. Mm -hmm. So why, why is that? What, why has there not been a big change in the basic philosophy? Well, because it, it it's true. I mean, you know, you have markets that will move um, in a broad fashion, and that hasn't changed. Now, like you said, there's just different ways to try and uh, target that and see what the indicators are. But you know, you're going to see, um, based on a variety of reasons, of which shouldn't play into your system, but all these fundamental things that come into play that are going to cause these large trends in in, in certain markets. So. I think that's something that's always going to be there. Um, there has been increase in volatility. A lot of the markets have gotten a lot bigger, and there's a lot more markets. But um, you're always going to find those big long-term trends, and um, capturing them, and knowing when to get in, when to get out, and is the most important thing. And again, getting back to those, the discipline thing, it's I saw it so many times uh, watching the turtles during those years where they'd get in, get stopped out, have to get in, get stopped out, have to get in, get stopped out, and the ones who were successful that. The fifth time through, they were buying it again, for example, if it's going up. And the ones who kind of were gun-shy, those are the ones who weren't successful because they let their emotions get into play and would, would maybe miss the trade. So it, it always goes back to me to the discipline that uh, the trader has. And then I think, you know, I mentioned one time on, I think, your Facebook page that I think there's also some times when 
the great traders um, override the system, and it's rare, but I've seen it, and I've seen the turtles do it. Um, when everybody, you know, you, you pick up every newspaper, every magazine, it's, you know, dial 55,000 during a big bull market. There are some times where I think you have to um, take that into account. Hmm. So let me let me let me switch slight gears on you. And like I said, we don't really have to uh, <clears throat> to go into to names, but you, as we've talked, you you had a, a an interesting bird's eye view, and, and and I've had a chance to kind of see. Obviously, I wasn't there when you were there, but I, I've had a chance to see behind the scenes a little bit too. Um, what what was the what was the over the overall? I, I knew you said, well, look, with Liz and Paul, the great discipline. I'm sure you could say the, you could say the opposite thing for the for the for the some of the turtles that didn't get it. But were there are, were there things you can look back on, personality traits or or ways of being? Uh, I mean, I saw I saw what I saw from the ones that frankly have not had great careers. I saw quite a bit of uh, personal volatility, like a lot of just just personal volatility in, in their behaviors. Can you reflect on, on, on why some didn't get it or, or, or what might've been the reasons? You know, there are, as you probably know, maybe one or two that I, that I would say had some personal issues, but for, for overall, I'd have to say this, that, that they're one of the smartest group of people that I've ever been around. I mean, we would, you know, have parties and have people over and, you know, just the discussions that would happen, not just about trading, but just about everything that's going on in the world. I mean, there's some brilliant people in there. There's some people that were very successful in other careers and had a, a, just a great worldview. So, um, I should clarify. I, I mean, I, I really did mean no more than a handful, but I, I guess there's mm -hmm. something to be learned from just the, the few too. I didn't, I didn't mean to, by any stretch to say there was, uh, you know, I knew it was, it was a, it was a small minority. Yeah, and I think the circumstances of, of you know looking back and saying who's successful, who's not successful. Um, some of the some of the turtles chose not to um, you know to be out there in the public and accept public funds. I suspect some of them are still trading. We don't even know um, how well or they're doing. Um, others, uh, I think that during the the three years of the experiment um, or five years of the experiment, weren't allocated as much money as others. So you know they they didn't they maybe have some of the same gains, but. Post uh, the Richard Dennis experiment, um, again, I think it's just access. It's how they sold themselves, how they marketed themselves, whether they wanted to get uh, funds in, in, a, in a fund of funds or some other um, vehicle. So, you know, then there were some who have maybe had some famous blowouts, um, and maybe that was uh, due to, um, again, lack of discipline. And there were some of those that maybe occurred during the turtle experiment as well. And well, I'm not even going to follow up there, but I know where you were going with that because I kind of wrote a little <laughs> bit about that. <laughs> um, and, and some of those people would probably argue that what you just said never happened. <laughs> yeah, probably. Uh, but you know what? I've looked at enough of the numbers to know uh, the numbers that I could find. And, you know, I'll tell you something interesting just as, as now that I'm reflecting, too. For me, when I was putting that book together, probably would not have been anywhere near as of an interesting book or story and i i just was the, the caretaker of it but the fact that i i think it was uh saul waxman at barclays and i bumped into him and uh he was the only person that had the performance data or at least that was willing to give it all an aggregate mm -hmm. for all the traders at one time so that for me and i can't remember what point in the book process that i got that that was the that was like the ah okay now we've now we're now we're cooking. Now we now that I've got all these interviews from all these different people that are saying things that for all I know could have been subjective memories that weren't really true. Then all of a sudden I've got performance data and I'm like, oh, some of the allocation stories were 100 percent true. Here's the performance data to back it. Mm -hmm. And what's also true, what's about the performance data was the omissions is, you know, the 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 performance data that existed that Saul had um that was fantastic evidence, but I think the stuff that he didn't have was fantastic evidence and probably actually went to exactly what you were just saying, which was that even during the experiment, there might have been some turtles that had some severe issues in terms of trading. And so by, by the omission, for, at least this was my whole process, by the omission of him not having the data for some of the folks was telling. Yeah, I mean, I have no doubt that some particular traders in that experiment had 
very large losses and then all of a sudden we're refunded or, you know, that, there's no doubt. There's no doubt about that. And, you know, you think when I talked about the infighting, you know, I'm not, of course, not going to mention names, but there are, you know, for example, if one trader's trading a $2 million account and another one's trading a $200,000 account and they both make 100%, just think about the, you know, the impact on their bonus when they were think, getting 20 or 25%, whatever it was. So um, there were some resentments and jealousy which I guess would be typical in something like this. And again, I, I don't know um, Rich's actual thought process. Maybe this was part of the experiment to see how people react to that kind of stuff. Lord, Lord of the Flies or something. Like everyone's on an island mm-hmm. and you start. <laughs> it's, it's, it really is terribly interesting. I, I, you know, I, I, I don't know. I, you know, he's, he's, never, he's never commented exactly uh, all of his thinking behind the process. But uh, it's, Yeah, and uh, it got even deeper than that. Certain of the turtles were working on... Um, tweaking the system and working on developing the system. And then people who wanted to get involved in that formed a click and other people were resentful of that. So there was a lot of stuff going on during that five years that um, certainly I don't think impacted Liz and Paul, which is again, part of the reason that Dave Kavanaugh and I selected them because they, they seemed, well, they were part of it. Of course they had to be you have all these people stuffed in one room for a couple of years. Um, they, uh, they seemed to always stay focused on, on what they were doing. And that was a trading. Yeah. Yeah. Um, is there, is there, you know, we mentioned a couple names here. We've mentioned, uh, Liz and Paul and Jerry Parker and Stig Osgard. Are, are there, uh, Tom Shanks, which, uh, many of the names that are still trading today, are there any mm-hmm. other, you mentioned Anthony Brock, are there any other names that you kind of look back and, uh, really kind of, uh, it, admired, uh, something about them or their trading or their way? I mean, from to me, I mean, I kind of made a little list of the people that were involved. Um, those were the people that stand, stood out to me that that I can recall right now. I don't have them all written down. I, I couldn't remember a couple of them, but those are the people that stood out to me and impressed me the most. Yeah. Um, well, let me ask. Let me. I don't know where I'll get with this particular question, but obviously, I, we could we could we could talk for a long time. But what uh, things that I might not even think to ask about that time period and in your overall view of trend trading and watching that process and watching uh, frankly many cases neophytes uh go through this process and and some of them become legends is, is there anything else that you'd want to kind of add from your perspective i know i, I know seriously if we sat down i could probably turn the tape recorder on and keep you far all day and i eventually would get you to kind of well, I might not. Maybe you'd be like, I'm not saying anything, but <laughs> I'd try. There's certainly, I would a lot. Tr- There's certainly a lot I could say. There's a lot of right. stories. There's a lot of things. Yeah. And, um, overall, I'd say, I think you kind of nailed it, like seeing these neophytes come in. And that to see everybody and meet everybody in the beginning. And by the time 83 came around, I mean, our floor operation was pretty successful. So, um, you know, I thought I was a big shot. But um, then to see, to look back, even just four or five years later, um, to see how everyone changed. And, and not in a bad way. I think that... Um, People's lifestyles changed, you know, where they lived, where they, what they were doing, um, how their families grew in some cases. I think it was just fascinating to be able to watch that. And then to put it in perspective of how Rich um, picked the people. I mean, it's just the whole thing to me is fascinating. And, and I think that whatever they did or whatever the psychological profile that they used, it worked because you look at how successful many of those people were that were just picked, you know, from responding to an ad in the newspaper. The whole thing is great. It should be a movie. Well, um, I agree. I, I agree with it. On, uh, on, I agree completely on that sentiment. Um, uh, I, 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 I would love to do that. Uh, I just don't know if, uh, I don't know if you could get everybody to, uh, to sign off on it. I, I think, I think, it, not. yeah, I think it's, I think it's, I think from my perspective, Given I, I, when I after finishing doing the book, I said to myself, OK, that was really interesting. Fifty percent of the people involved in this process are wide open, extremely candid and will tell you like it is. The other 50 percent are paranoid to the sense just paranoid. They don't want to say anything. And mm-hmm. so I, I I just don't know if you could ever. And, but, but my perspective, though, the interesting thing was, is I really drew the conclusion that I thought a lot of the uh, the paranoia and the and the gun shy about talking was misdirected. That I, I really thought it was it, any any at least from my perspective any negatives they might have thought about expanding the story 
would be far outweighed by expanding the story. I, mean, I, I just, I, I just didn't, I never saw it my, from my perspective. Well, maybe, but I'll tell you this: that some of those folks, um, that was just their personality. Hmm. I mean, I recall um, introverted, maybe going to some of the conferences, and uh, again, I won't say the names, but you know, some of the CTAs would just stay up in our room and would meet with prospective clients just individually and we'd go down and bring them up because they didn't, they just didn't want to be in the public. They didn't want to talk to anybody. They didn't want to be around it. So, um, it, it, I think it was just person. I, I don't know that it was directed at you or directed at anybody. I think some of those people, even back to the early days were, were just kind of, yeah, introverts. Yeah. I didn't know. I, I, I never, I never took it. I never took any of it. Uh, uh, I never took any of it personally or anything like that. I just looked at it. It was just an interesting observation on my end. Um, mm-hmm. but I always thought, I always thought that the, the story, and I, I will say this, I, I sometimes will hit people, they'll say, they'll use words like dated or this or that, and it's like, hold on, that story is timeless, okay? Mm-hmm. That story is timeless, and your ex-wife's track record proves it, Paul Raybar's track record proves it, I mean, and so on and so on. This story has not ended, um, and who knows how long it's going to go on. Right, yeah, you know, and I, I agree with your perspective. Like, when I worked at, when well, we were at Refco, you know, Tom Dittmer was the kind of ran that firm and his, his mantra used to be all news is good news, whether it's good or bad and you get your name in the paper, right? It's publicity. And I, you know, believe that. And I think if, you know, if, it depends again though, what, what the end game is. If, if uh, you're a former turtle and you're managing a certain amount of money and you're happy with it and you're not really out trying to expand your empire, um, you really don't need to participate in something like that. Yeah. So I don't know. I mean, I wouldn't, I won't judge any of them. But my other overall comment, I guess I would make about the whole thing is uh, about Rich, that he was just a great guy, um, brilliant, generous, um, and it was uh, a really uh, fun time to be around that whole thing. And uh, we interacted with him a lot, and it was, uh, I have nothing negative to say about him. No, I, I the phil- philosophically, uh, everything that he's, uh, he's just one of those guys that when he, put anything out there. And he, he was pretty vocal early on, even doing the early research of seeing a lot of the things that he would put in print, because uh, he's a pretty quoted guy between, let's say, 1976 mm-hmm. and, you know, mid 80s. I'll tell you, it was one of those guys, it's like, it's almost like he was, it was reminiscence of a stock operator, the way almost everything he would say would be just this this perfect parable, this perfect story where mm-hmm. you you would read it and you'd be like, oh, wow, I just learned a trading lesson today. You know, what are those kinds of guys, right? I mean, mm-hmm. I, 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 yeah, and he wasn't shy, right? He wasn't shy about um, discussing that kind of stuff at that time. And I haven't followed it much lately, but you know, maybe the impact of some of the things that happened in the mid '80s with with the money he was managing uh, might have maybe changed his perspective on on all that. So, well, I th- there was. I think there's still, if you look back on it, there's still quite a few people that 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 write uh, uh, articles, press types. They really don't know what the hell they're talking about. Excuse my French, but mm-hmm. they did. They don't know what they're talking about, and so they they see a down month, and you know, then the next thing you know, it's the it's the end times, and um, you know, that's not changed. I mean, let's face it, managed futures still. I, I look out there, the people that that write articles, and the vast majority of them seemingly don't know what they're talking about. Still, to right, this, right. <laughs> you know, nothing's right. changed. Speculators are, speculators are doing everything and drawing up drawing prices of gold and silver and they don't know what they're talking about right no i the fact that speculation is an evil term is insane mm-hmm. i mean it's it speculate we all speculate every day we all speculate whether we're going to get an education take this job make this company uh, rent that house buy that house we're all speculating we're all speculators and, and the idea that anybody and i'm not even making a political statement here but anybody talking about speculation is evil is 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 frankly spinning and manipulating with that very statement Mm-hmm. So I agree. My humble opinion. But uh, well, listen, it was good chatting. Uh, I mean, is there is there I'm just trying to think. Look, wait a minute. I didn't ask you what what was your uh, did you have? Uh, I know he's he's kept up his track record over the years. We didn't talk about Bill Eckhart. I didn't talk about Bill. And yeah, I um, had I had less interaction with Bill personally, so I don't really have much to say um, about Bill. Of course, he's a great trader and he has a good track record. But uh I didn't really get to know him as well, so I don't really have you know anything really to say about him. Gotcha, gotcha. Well, listen, it was it was good chatting. I, I you know hopefully we can we can chat again. I mean, it's a good you know it's like kind of our first meeting. It's always uh, it's always interesting, and and frankly, I would say for a good majority of these podcasts, I've not had a chance to sit down with everybody. Uh, 
I'd have to go back and look at the percents, but uh, I always enjoy them where the conversation's easy and it flows. And uh, so, but you've been a, you've been a good guest, and I appreciate your time, Dave. Oh, sure. Thanks, Mike. Anytime. I see a time when those awake will understand how to make money in up, down, and surprise markets. Whether new trader or experienced, college student or financial advisor, protecting against a crash or just trying to make a lot of money, Trend Following offers everyone an answer in uncertain times. To get started immediately, send me an email, michael at covell.com. I will send you the right trend following steps to take along with my free video. But if you want to buy and hold, trust the government and trust Wall Street. This is absolutely not for you.